again. So thanks um, for now and Bobby and June for keeping the ship alive. And also wanted to just thank um, Thich Nhat Hanh for all the wisdom that we received from him and also our founder, um, Brother Chi Singh. So I know when uh, Chi Singh, I would go uh, to community with him and Sangha, it always opened my heart. And so I wanted to um, just share a couple months ago, Bobby um, had was talking about, there's so much division and separation that's happening you know, right now in life, you know, politically and religiously all around us. And so, you know, that kind of hit my heart that, you know, I don't want separation. And, you know, commitment I've made in my practice is um, to try to look to see where I put up walls of separation and how I'm responding to that. And so I want to keep my heart open. And so I try to view it through how would love respond to this? So I thought tonight we could talk a little bit about, you know, separation, inclusion, what disconnects us. And I wanted to do so by sharing uh, through the Native American culture and some of the, the insights that they have given and through one of my teachers, Louis Madrona, who is a psychiatrist. And so um, he was sharing about this book that he had read it's called Acceleration and Alienation. And he was sharing that, you know, today's world is faster and faster paced, which we know. And the more acceleration definitely creates more loneliness and, you know, disconnection, you know, within us. And he said that partly, you know, there's seeds that have been planted through capitalism. And, uh, you know, we can kind of feel that, you know, what's happening. He said, so how it may show up is that we're always wanting, you know, there's never enough. We're always wanting more. And so that that nature to, to try to have more desire to, you know, cling on to everything. And then, you know, immediate gratification. If we don't have it right now, then we get angry. We get mad. So those little seeds are, you know, they, they start to plant in that we... We kind of buy in at some level that we may not realize at a subtle level that we may be participating, you know, in that as well. We also kind of sh shared that the focus with that has to do more with me as an individual so that everybody's out for themselves. It's kind of like a lone society, the way that things are governed. Um, and when we rule, you know, from top down, uh, we may feel more competitive because we are competing to get ahead again. And then, you know, also competing for our resources. So all of that, you know, is kind of out there right now. So we know that's out there in our practices to kind of shift it. And so his teachings, you know, one was to start to focus on how people heal. And healing, he was looking at his Lakota, he was a Lakota elder, and how they do their healing together is through, you know, that it's not done alone. So if somebody in the community is not well, they try to combine all their resources to help that person with their pain. And it's kind of like we do as well, you know, in our teachings is that we try to breathe in the pain of another and let it transform through our heart that we can give back out, you know, courage to others. So he went on about um, how um, this support is really necessary. I mean, that we can't heal, um, you know, healing alone takes longer. And that when we are, you know, in community that way, it helps us. So Thich Nhat Hanh also encourages us you know, to have family of Sangha, you know, different families of Sangha. So we have, he says, our biological family. If we don't have our biological family, we have a spiritual family that we are here, you know, together with. And also our family of activities, you know, what we find pleasure in. 
but to really start to resource ourselves to know that that's available. And when we're in community to heal, 12 step programs, um, those things are going to heal us faster than trying to do it alone. And also, we're not alone, just us, as I was saying, one person, but it's the environment as well. So, you know, the way that trees heal each other is their root system is really deep. And so the stronger trees are always feeding the weaker trees so that the weaker trees can become stronger and that they're fed that way. As well as you probably heard, like, you know, the way that mushrooms grow, it's like a connective tissue that forms underground and that kind of holds us together with so many nutrients and, and ways that we um, are connected that way. So that was one. So uh, to be able to know we heal faster in uh, support groups, groups of people. And then the other was just the notion that we call, you know, our interdependence, you know, towards each other. Um, our interconnection, and that we need each other. So when we're, you know, we're babies, first off, we really need each other to regulate our emotions. So when the mother sees the baby, uh, she's mirroring back to the child. The child is happy, you know, oh, look at you, you're smiling. Or, oh, that must not feel so good. So giving the feedback to the child reinforces within the trust that our feelings and our emotions are okay. Because we've been given often, you know, that our emotions, you know, are not good to push away uncomfortable emotions, but we need that validation from each other. We need to regulate, we regulate our feelings with each other in community. You know, and our in our dogs may also help regulate us, our animals, and so that support that we get, you know, through that regulation and the things that are around us, um, in terms of our relationship to space. So, connecting to our environment, you know, and nature spaces. He talked about you know the community of the cloud community, you know, our uh, stone family, our stone nation, the squirrel nation, that we've kind of disconnected from that we're a part of that, they are a part of us, that that all comes together, and we want to nurture that. So I know during um, COVID, and, you know, still during this time, you know, it was really hot this summer, just noticing the spaces that you're in, and that we really be present that they feed us. This was noticing my water feeder was empty and you know, just putting water in there and seeing how joyful the birds were to come in and you know, drink the water. So we don't really take time to realize you know, we're really a part of each other and that our spaces, sometimes we hold so separate from each other. You know, my, my cat was shot. Um, recently by an air gun because it was in the space of someone else's, you know, so to say territory. And, you know, the, those things is that we don't want to just claim it as mine, but to really open our view that it's ours. You know, one of the teachings um, that he gave was, you know, every time you go into a bathroom, <clears throat> clean it. It's not just their space, the, the Dallas Meditation Center space, that they should do the cleaning. But no, we should do the cleaning in any public, you know, and, and to make our spaces better because that's a part of who we are. This is, we're a part of it all. And what makes me up as a person is everything that I've interacted with. So that means my family, my neighborhood, my communities that I come to, you know, the institution, the people at the grocery store. So all of that collective is coming in and out of us to form who we are. So we think of ourselves as a self, but we're really, no, we're, we're giving to each other constantly. So that feedback of energy is, is moving, you know, moving through us. And um, so he, uh, 
there was an, another Alaskan climate change uh, Native American. And I wanted just to share his story too. And so his story was, he really wanted to impress you are sacred. The big bang of wisdom divinity is the ground of your being. And so he was sharing this, that he grew up in a community on an island, and that's how they view each other as sacred. And then to really hold that each person on that island was, you know, part of the community that had wisdom. So the sacredness holds a wisdom and it doesn't matter at what age, what age the value is there, the elders to the young, that it should be seen just as sacred as anyone else. So there's not this high hierarchy up and down, but it is a collective of it all. And um, so he, he was sharing how the way that he was raised, that in that community, um, you know, his aunt would teach him how to cook. Everybody in the village would teach him how to cook and, and the elder men would teach him how to hunt. And, and the same with the women and vice versa. Everybody was learning each other's skills. They became better at whatever um, that they did, but they all kind of pitched in because they knew if they didn't help each other, you know, then they're not gonna exist. And the better that they work together, their survival was enhanced, but also their joy. So the joy that they could see and also how they participated in the environment. So he um, said one day he wanted to buy an airplane. So his uncle or his grandfather um, had his own store and they didn't really make a lot. And so he stole money from his grandfather's register to go buy this airplane. And the, the amount of money he took would take them, you know, like half a year <laughs> for that much money because they didn't, you know, it was just a small island. So he, he went into the other place that he could get his airplane and the, um, he bought it and behind him was his aunt. And his aunt um, looked at him and said, wow, how did you get that airplane? <laughs> and he, he goes, well, you know, I, 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 took, I took the money from my grandfather. And she just looked at him, said, oh, okay, were you gonna do anything, you know, about that and just let it be. And so he decided to get the, you know, return the, the airplane and he went back home. And what he decided to do was to tell his grandfather that he stole or he, that he had bought stole the money out of the register and bought this plane. And the grandfather looked at him and said, you're a good boy. Thank you for telling me and being honest. So I just thought it was such a beautiful way to train, you know what I mean, for us to be greedy, not to be groomed with shame. That you did something, rawr, you know, he said so he knew, you know, that comes, by feeling it inside, you know, he knew that was something, you know what I mean? The aunt already kind of gave him the message, you know, without having to shame. And I just thought that that's what we need more of too. So uh, Otto, that Alaskan um, Native American also says that the way, and in most indigenous cultures that spirit is anchored into the body. So the spirit is anchored into the body by that which breathes in as you breathe in and out and that which moves your blood. So in yoga, we call that, you know, this drop of the divine that's inside of you, life force, prana, Another word we use is oja. So there's something in you moving you, you know, the same way that the moon moves the, the ocean. You know? So it's happening around us all the time, but it's inside of us. So this drop 
where that big bang of wisdom divinity is in each of you. It's in me. And we could think of it like a uh, lake, you know, that, that drop is in a lake. If the lake doesn't have uh, little feeders by itself and on its own, it will become stagnant. But it needs that feeder river, and that river can flow into the ocean. And in the ocean, we call that universal consciousness. So that holds the greater um, intelligence. And what we call it sometimes is Abhitabha. So Abhitabha is infinite light, infinite love, infinite life. And I like the infinite part of it. So this infinite part of it means that it is all knowing, has innate intelligence of everything that came before and everything that comes after us. And we have that drop. So that drop is in there and that is really cool. And it has a different intelligence than the way our brain thinks. All right, so in our body, you know, our, we are kind of complicated beings. We have a physical, you know, mental, emotional, the spiritual thing is all happening together. It, we call it consciousness. <laughs> In uh, yoga, we say there's a, there's a, a uh, we say an elevation from instinctual level, you know, that's kind of a little heavier, more reactive, more primitive to intuitive, kind of sensing, all right, we're, purifying this energy within that we get exposed to, to um, that that's inspiring. So we look to see what our responses are. Am I reacting out of a primitive just response because I'm angry about something and I react that way? Or can I pause for a moment and just kind of like hmm, come back inside and to connect? So I thought we could just look at that, you know, for a moment, because often what we do is we forget this part about this innate wisdom that's inside of us. And so it kind of has like a, you know, beautiful quantum field of intelligence. And what we do is we may start to operate out of um, the separation and the separation is usually, you know, begins just because we're here as human beings through survival, you know, so that survival mechanism, you know, kicks in is fight or flight response to try to protect our bodies. And so when we protect our bodies, especially when we're young, we may have had something that was wounding to us, you know, an experience we all do. So we're forming all the time with these things that can hurt us. And at a young age, sometimes our perception isn't clear enough to understand everything that's going on. And we may have a misperception or start to believe something about ourselves that isn't true. And it kind of, you know, it's cloudy vision, right, at that point. And it happens, you know, I mean, without us realizing it. And often what will happen then is that that response, you know, comes in the body, we can feel like, oh my gosh, that really hurts, or I'm scared of something. And our body kind of holds a form, like, Ugh, you know, or ah, and it's happening again unconsciously, it happens very quickly. And then we may make a decision that we don't realize. And then we continue to live that way with that same view, you know, so that same view is there. And it, it's held in our memory, in our, in our body tissue. It's, held, it's in there through our nervous system. And it becomes automatic. So all of a sudden, then we're, we're just automatically responding in a way that we may not really choose. So it's just automatic. And so that's kind of like step one to go, wait a minute, wow. You know, I don't, I'm halfway living through life out of old, old habits. So what we want to do is to be able to choose and look at right view, clear thinking, you know, right speech. How are we thinking? You know, what are we feeling? Um, so part of this survival 
creates, as I'm sharing, a defense mechanism. And I like to, you know, and my therapy work with people one-on-one, -on -one, say it's a protective mechanism. So it's not something that we want to be mad at or that it, we shouldn't have. It's an important thing. We want to hold it with compassion that something happened at some point that might have caused us harm. We may not have a good view, you know, I mean, it may be a little bit oriented, you know, like I said, misperception. And then we, we hold the pattern. So for me, uh, to give an example, when I was younger, I didn't feel like it, in my home, you know, like feelings you weren't really able to like always share with, you know, one of the parties. Uh, and I felt like I was misunderstood. So whenever I was trying to share what really happened, um, it was kind of shut down. And so I would keep pushing it, you know what I mean? I was kind of like became defensive so that when someone didn't understand me, my pattern later in life became as a defensiveness, you know, so like, you know, but I really didn't mean to be defensive. I just really wanted to be understood, you know, deeply until I actually started to feel in my body that my body was having a defending. Okay, and our bodies hold these positions. You know, like I'm saying, they can have a, a victim stance, like poor me and all this, all like that. And so we start, our body starts to carry that type of energy or like I said, defender or attacker. And it may need to defend or attack. And what it, it's doing is not being able to be with what we feel. So, so when these automatic reactions happen, we're just having a feeling. We just need to slow down and notice what we're feeling rather than putting on the defense, like blaming others, or projecting, you know, onto. So we wanna relax a little bit and try to understand, come back with a heart of compassion to understand way, why we may be doing these things. So a practice in, inwards, um, somatically, because as I was sharing, you know, early on, how we develop is through, you know, we're just energetic beings. Emotions and thought are just energy moving through our body. And so it can build up as tension. We want to, you know, we want to let it to move out. So first, we need to find that place of refuge a place of safety, a place of grounding, so that we can relax enough to be able to realize that there's something going on. Okay, so we know here we use our place of refuge, you know, in Sangha to be able to share and let down our guard and to be able to speak, you know, freely. And, you know, that's really important to do. So when we Notice that we may have an instinctual, you know, habit or just a reaction out of anger or maybe fear. We just want to pause for a minute and, you know, try to understand it a little better. And so what we go in, I mean, we can, you can journal, you know, journaling helps. I journal a lot, you know, sharing with a friend who accepts you and under, you know, let you speak, you know, or to go to a therapist or move your body. Like yoga is a wonderful thing to move that energy through dancing, singing, drumming, um, playing an instrument. So those things all change, you know, that pattern for us, for us to consciously, you know, come back. So the practice is me kind of moving from our defensive stance, knowing that there's nothing wrong with that, you know, armoring or protecting. So just, you know, at the gentle asking myself, why might this be to develop understanding why I might be that way? And then finding safety, comfort, and relaxation. And then the next part is, you know, that part of, you know, really surrendering to allow things to be the way that they are. Uh, and, you know, that's such a hard thing when our mind, you know, tries to make it something else that we have to just really come back to knowing the illusion. <laughs> we just, if we can just be with, you know, 
what what's happening and see it clearly as it is, it will pass. And not to identify something as who you are, you know, your thoughts or your beliefs. We don't want to identify ourselves as that, but we want to identify as this beautiful light of the divine. So when we surrender, we're surrendering to that light. You know, in the reading, you know, Joyce, you know, the contemplation before meditation said. You know, we, we, we're not going to get lost. We're not going to drown in despair because the enlightened beings, all you as an enlightened being around me, you have the Buddha nature. We are, all have the Buddha nature. We're there in this collective field to hold each other, to hold each other up. And we want to, you know, build that for each other. So it may be just taking a moment to slow down, you know, to focus on your breath, and then notice what you're feeling and hold it you know, with compassion. So I'd like to do another little partner thing, um, if we could. So how many are up for that? Let me just see a raise of hands. Okay, so kind of like half of the room. <laughs> you don't have to do, you know, so I'll try to do it. I'll do it in big group. <laughs> how about that? We'll do it in big group and then we'll kind of have you know, the big collective group sharing, you know, so that you can you know, share that way. But we'll try just a little exercise on to kind of put you into this, this um, place that we've been talking about tonight to relax, to soften your heart, you know, and to come in. So if you don't mind to, again, go into a little meditation Positions, so you can go ahead and get comfortable and close your eyes. And as you close your eyes, kind of go back to that ground of your being, beautiful ground of your being. If you could think of yourself as a particular kind of ground. What would you want to fertilize yourself with? So what does the soil or the ground of your being, what does it need that would nourish it? Or maybe what kind of seeds would you plant in your garden? So it could be that seed of loving kindness or maybe a little patience. So just allowing that to be. And then let's just give it a little bit of support with some kindness. So I want you to visualize maybe someone that you know, that you've seen, that their eyes are looking at you with kindness. Could have been even someone at the checkout stand, at the grocery store, maybe just smiling at you. Or could have been the wag of a tail from your dog. Just seeing part of yielding is to be able to receive rather than push away. Or think of a kindness that a friend may have given you. Maybe in a form of support. You know, my, my neighbor supported me this week with my kitty. But just see if you could receive that with your breath. Take it in through your body and into your heart.
And then lastly, let's just hold the space in your heart as a place of inclusion that's welcoming all parts of you. And that as you breathe in, knowing I'm aware of my mind, Breathing out, I smile to my mind. Breathing in, I'm aware of my anger. Breathing out, I smile to my anger. Breathing in, I'm aware of my sadness. Breathing out, I smile to my sadness. You can just put your hand onto your heart. Just let yourself breathe into that big, beautiful, infinite heart that is connected to everything else around you and that you're totally supportive in this ground. And then we'll come back to this space. And I just thought it would end uh, by just saying the other parts of my practice to open your eyes when you're ready. The other parts of my practice then that I've learned from you know, coming into my body, sensing and feeling you know, where I am, uh, and then taking that pause to slow down, get grounded, relax and feel, was to remind myself that I'm no different than any other. Like to start my day by knowing I am no different than any other. There's no one any better or lesser than I. I come into interactions. And the one that I'm really trying to focus on right now is uh, just when things are really uncomfortable to not make it, you know, that that challenge is the blessing. So welcoming all the challenges as a way of growth, a growth opportunity, it's only purifying me from that instinctual level to move to intuitive to feel inspired so that I feel like I'm purified, letting the soul cleanse and purify my mind, my emotions, and my body. So I'll just leave you with that. And I thought if you wanted to open it, you know, for things that you might like to share, what helps you feel more connected to yourself and others, or things that may separate you, you know, from others, it's, you know, good to just own it, right? It's get it out there so then you can be more aware of it. So thank you.